Last week we talked a little bit about um, what the Bible says is how we can get in with God. We're talking about salvation and just, um, you know, what does God ask of us and, and where does it come from? And today I want to talk about how um, uh, God's work can be undone or could not be undone, depending on how you look at it. We're going to say it cannot be undone. I, I don't believe it can. It's kind of nice to have big giant mountains and things like that in the, in the background when we're thinking about um, the goodness and the greatness and the power and, and all that of our God and how that cannot be undone. So I, I started with the question, can God's work be undone? And the simple answer is no. No, it cannot be. And we're going to talk about that, and especially in relationship to our relationship with God and, and the area of salvation. Uh, what brings salvation? What is it that gets somebody in with God? We talked about that last week. From God's viewpoint, from, uh, on his part, what needs to be done is um, it's Christ's work on the cross. And there's nothing else that could have satisfied God's demands for us, what he requires of us. Uh, he wants a perfect offering, and Jesus is that perfect offering. And another aspect from God's viewpoint is that the Holy Spirit has to work and, and move in our hearts and in our lives and bring us to the point when we're open and available and interested in spiritual things. So uh, outside of God, no one is ever going to be in with him. Outside of what he's done for us to pay that price, we can't, we can't do it on our own. Um, nothing have I uh, to satisfy God. And, and without the work of the Spirit of God moving in our hearts, and, and that's so amazing because 99.9% .9 of us, when that happens, had no idea of what was going on, that there was a Holy Spirit that was moving and, and drawing us to God. So that's God's aspect in summary. I and mean, we spent the whole time last week on it. Um, from our viewpoint, uh, and what our part is and what we need to do, um, there has to be belief. There has to be something that we believe, and I don't think you have to know or understand everything about it, but uh, you do need to know and understand a little bit that you know God made us, I sinned, Christ died for our sins. That, that part we need to know and understand there's got to be faith in saying, yes, that, uh, you know what, that's right, that's true, that makes sense, that's what God did, and, and I want that as part of my life. There needs to be confession, I think there needs to be confession of sin, and there needs to be repentance from sin, uh, and, I, and I understand fully that none of us are able to totally 100% uh, present ourselves to God and be perfected, I mean, that's not going to happen in this life. Um, but that's pretty much the, the package of what we need to do. Um, if you uh, say, well, yeah, I believe that Jesus is God, but you have absolutely no concern about the sin in your life, you don't care one hoot about what you do and how you do it, then I'm going to say you're lacking something here. You're really missing in some ways. Or if you're just so concerned because you're just a, a sensitive person and oh my I do things wrong and I want to be forgiven and I want to be okay but you don't accept that it's Jesus um, then you're missing some as well last week we we gave you a couple examples and it was the Apostle Paul and Silas when they were in in a jail in uh, Philippi and, and the jailer and, and there was some events that happened and because of their lives and their testimony and their commit commitments to Christ. And the jailer just said, what do I need to do to have what you have? What must I do to be saved? And their answer was really simple. It's just believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is not rocket science. You know, God has he provided everything for us, and we just need to respond to him. And I know there's some that say, well, that's, that's easy believism. Well, I would say, yeah. And some would say that's cheap grace. And, and I understand what they're saying on that, but it's not easy believism. And it's certainly not cheap grace because it cost Jesus Christ his life on a cross. And it cost him giving up his throne in heaven to come to earth. So there's nothing cheap and there's nothing easy about it, but it's our responsibility 
to respond to God. We need to believe in our heart. We need to confess with our mouth that Jesus is God. That's what Romans 10 that we went over last week. It's, a, it's God's grace and it's his gift to us, uh, not coming from me at all. So uh, even our faith and our belief and our confession and our repentance, all of that is an act of God. All of that is something that he gives to us. So since salvation depends on what God has done through Christ, then God's work would, would have to be undone or reversed for me to lose my salvation. Now I'm going to talk a little bit in that area today about uh, is that possible? Can we undo God's work and, and someone lose their salvation? And I, I want to say that, again, 99% of the people that you run into that would say to you, well, you can't know, you can't, you can't be absolutely sure about salvation. I, I think most of them are very genuine and sincere, and they have issues and questions and illustrations that they can bring up in their mind. Uh, I don't think anybody there is trying to pervert the work of God or anything like that. But I think there's some, some issues that are clouded in that, and we need to, to think about that a little bit. God would have to take back his transaction. He'd have to take back his gift in order to strip me or strip you of the forgiveness that he's already given to you if that's what we believe the Bible teaches. And if that were so, I would think that the word of God would be very clear about that. If, if it were possible for God to strip me of forgiveness, I think he would be clear about that and want me to know a clear path back to him, if that's at all possible. So whenever we talk about salvation, we must start, and I would say stop, with God. That's so very, very important to do. Um, I'm going to show some verses and things to you, and we'll refer to some stuff here. Uh, you're going to need to do more study on your own, but, but these are really important concepts. This is one verse that I've thought for a long, 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 long time, 30 years about in this subject. And uh, it's 1 John 5.13. It says, John is writing, he's already written pretty much five chapters, he's wrapping it up. And in verse 13, he says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Lord, of, of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. That's why he's writing these things. So the purpose of his writing um, has to do with us knowing so that we can know for sure. Uh, and, and the word there that's used for know is a word that means so that you can see it and understand it and grasp it. That's what the word in the Greek means. It's something where I can grab this, I can get a hold of it, and I can comprehend it, and I can understand and know that this is the case. I understand that scripture teaches that you can know God and that you are saved and you can know that you are saved and that you can live secure in what God has provided for you. In fact, I would say if that's not true, if you cannot know that you are saved and that you are secure for eternity in that, then you really need to rip out the, the book of 1 John because he just told you that's why he's writing this book, so that you can know. And so who's the audience that he's speaking about there? It's those who believe in Jesus as God. Anyone who's accepted Jesus as God and that concept, that package deal of who he is and what he has offered for us. And he said the result of that is that you can know that you have eternal life, that you can know that. You don't need to be insecure about that. Uh, you can know for sure based on what he has done. A little bit later in, in 1 John chapter 5, um, when we get to verse 18, it says this. We know that anyone born of God does not continue in sin. Okay, now that's, that's one issue, but we're not dealing with that today. But it basically means that I am not habitually practicing the same sin over and over again because those who believe in Christ deal with sin in their lives. 
So uh, it could be, okay, I'm not always alcoholic, okay? I, or it might mean I don't always jaywalk. I kind of do that occasionally. But, um, you know, you work on those sins. That's basically what it means there. The one who was born of God keeps him safe. That's a reference to Christ. That's not a reference to you and me as believers. It's Christ who keeps us safe. And the evil one cannot harm him. The evil one cannot hurt me. Satan, when I'm in Christ, cannot destroy me away from Christ. He cannot do that. So um, the word there for um, harm, or in some translations it says he cannot touch touch him. Um, one of the Greek scholars, uh, Vine, you need to know who it is, says this. That word means to assault in order to sever that, sever that vital union between Christ and the believer. It can't be done. Satan can't do that. He cannot interrupt your relationship with God. He's going to try. He's going to defeat you and discourage you and do everything he can to make you feel insecure. But from God's perspective, he's not going to win. He's not going to be able to do that. Uh, not even the devil can break this union that you have because of Jesus Christ. And God's son is one of those who keeps, it, keeps us safe. That word harm, too, is talking about a very, very strong hold that Satan's going to try to put on you. I want to read to you a couple verses from John chapter 10. And these are found in, in the middle of a dialogue that Jesus is giving when he's talking about his own believers and their sheep and they know his voice and they follow him. And I'm going to read verses 27 through 30. It says, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. It tells us there that the subject of who he's talking about are the sheep, the sheep that belong to Jesus. Those are his children, those who follow him. Uh, these are the true believers. And it says the results of what they have because they're following Jesus and, what, uh, and they're believing on him is that they, he gives them eternal life. He gives them eternal life. That's one thing that they have. Uh, he says they'll never perish. They can't be destroyed. He says also that no one can snatch them. And he says that twice in there. He says twice that uh, you're secure, you're in the hand. And Jesus says, first of all, that I have you in my hands. And then he says, the Father has you and me in, your hand, in his hands. So we are uh, basically, and that's something that Chuck Swindoll says, it's a double wall of security. We're in Christ's eternal grip, and we and he are in the Father's hand as well. It's impossible for anyone or anything to snatch them out. Now, here's where um, uh, it gets kind of strange. I, I can remember, and I read this back when I was in school, so that was hundreds of years ago. I was carrying my clay tablets, and somebody wrote this. Um, they said, well... So this was a theological argument. I, yeah, I know nobody can snatch me out of God's hands, but I can jump out on my own. I can commit sin. And I think that, you know, what they were doing, and there's, this is where part of the problem comes, is that, you know, we observe other people. We look at people and we say, well, that person was really sharp and strong and did a lot of really good God things, but then all of a sudden they went haywire. Something went wrong and... They went off the deep end, and, and boy, are they doing screwy things in their lives. So they obviously jumped out of God's hand somehow. Well, there's, there's other possibilities as well. Um, and, I, and I have in my notes written, I don't think I have it in yours, but I have it written in my notes that um, some of these are either ignorant or arrogant. And I put in my notes that the average person who's, not real verse is probably ignorant. It's, it's more the theologians who tend to be arrogant on that viewpoint. Um, it, here's the question. 
um, or maybe it's not a question, it's really, um, here's a perspective. Some thing, can you commit a sin, it is a question, can you commit a sin that is so great that you can undo the work that Jesus Christ did? Are you able to do that? Um, can you find me a sin in the scriptures that says, you know, uh, you are my child, you are my sheep, you are protected, you are safe, you are secure, oh, until you do this. If you do this one, then you're in trouble. Now, I know that the two answers that people are going to give on that are going to be the, um, uh, the unpardonable sin that Jesus talks about, although I think that was a cultural of his day time, giving tribute to Satan, the works that, Satan, that Jesus was doing. Uh, I don't think that's a today issue, but, you know, if you want to take that, that's fine. Any other one which kind of is sort of obvious, some will say, well, unbelief in Jesus is an unpardonable sin. Well, yeah, that's true. That's, I mean, you can't get to heaven unless you believe in Jesus, and I understand that. But I think what people see is that illustration of someone who's, who is a rising star and then all of a sudden abandons ship. And they look at that and they say, see, there's an example of someone who was secure in Christ but is no longer secure. He jumped out of his hand. Um, and, that, and they can think that way if they want. But um, I would suggest that that's more of a question of is that person and were they ever really saved? And, uh, and we'll talk about that here in just a little bit more in a moment. When Jesus says twice in there that no one can snatch them, including Satan, no one can snatch them out of my hands, I, I would question, does Jesus really need to repeat things for us to, to understand and to believe what he's saying? I think it's pretty key and very important. In your outline, I give you a whole bunch of other passages, and there could be hundreds more. But I give you some like in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, it talks about there that we are the full possession of this Holy Spirit of God. And he owns us when we become believers. In Ephesians 1, verse 13, and also in Ephesians 4, verse 30, it tells us that when we've come to faith in Christ, that we are sealed by the Holy Spirit. So... Um, uh, that's something that happens, and in order for us to lose salvation, we'd have to somehow break that seal of the Spirit of God, and I think that's, uh, that's questionable. Uh, he says we're, and in, in, verse, in Ephesians 4.30, it actually says that we are sealed unto the day of redemption, and the day of redemption is that day when we stand before Christ and we receive our new bodies and we go on and, and live eternally with God. So if we're sealed under then, until the day, I mean, if you were to say, well, yeah, you're sealed until the day you sin, okay, I understand that. But it says you're sealed until the day that you stand before him, the day of redemption, when you're standing before Christ and you're going to live eternally with him. In Romans chapter 8, verse 1, I think you know the verse, it talks about there's no condemnation in Christ. Now, you and I can look at each other and we can come up with a lot of problems in our lives. And we can, uh, we can cause a lot of guilt for each other and, and embarrassing moments, and, and rightfully so, because we have them. But in Christ, there's no condemnation. There's none. And then when you get to the end of that chapter, verses 31 to the end, especially verse 35, it asks that big question, what can separate us from the love of God? What is there that can ever take us out of God's grace and love? Uh, and then it, and it gives all those possibilities and says none of them can do it. And possibilities are things like life and death, uh, things like visible things, invisible things. There's nothing that can separate us from the love of God when we are in Christ Jesus. In Jude, verse 24, it tells us that we're going to stand blameless before God with great joy. That's going to be me with all my problems, with all my sin, with everything that I've been embarrassed about in life and everything that I've failed in in life and everything that is wrong. And someday when I stand before Christ, not because of me, but when God filters that out of my, totally out of me because I'm in Christ and I stand before him, I'm going to be there not embarrassed and scared and silly, although there will be some fear and all, but I will be filled with joy because of what Christ has done. 
and the transformation that it brings. It's like all of our sin will fall off of us, all of it, and we'll, we will see that we stand in his righteousness. And when we do that, we are going to be absolutely ecstatic. And again, I ask, can I sin a sin that is so great that it takes away my grace in Christ? And the answer is no. I don't believe you can. And if you think so, then you're probably, oh, man, I, I hate saying this, but you may be thinking pretty high of yourself if you think that you are so great that you can do something that's even greater than what Jesus did to pay for that. The problem with the issue, I think, is really a misunderstanding, and I think the misunderstanding comes from the, the argument that Paul gives in 1 Corinthians about carnality, about living in the flesh, and, and you know, can a believer really backslide? That, that's what we used to call it in my day, uh, to that. And I think the other issue is doubt about self. And I think people should doubt themselves. I think you should doubt yourself. I should doubt myself. I think we should do that. Um, but instead, what I see, at least in this theological argument, people are doubting God and not themselves or not the person that they use in their mind as the illustration. Uh, they cannot see how God could grant forgiveness when actually they probably have not really experienced it at all. Uh, or maybe they, that person has an experience and they can't see how God would do that. I, I think the doubt should never be God. God paid the price, God did the job, God did what all needs to be done. He prepared your heart, he got it all ready, he brought you to that point. The doubt should be in ourselves. Now, next week, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about that whole area of our own personal doubts. There are troubled passages on this, this um, uh, theory and on this belief and this doctrine in the scriptures. For sure, one of them would be Hebrews chapter 6. I think there's a great answer to that. I think that's just simply a hypothetical question. It cannot happen. And, uh, but there are some problems scriptures and you need to think those through but the vast majority of the word of God the vast majority of the word of God teaches that when we know Christ we are secured in him and and I learned a long time ago when I was in school that when you come to a verse in scripture that's a problem and you can't figure that out and it doesn't fit what everything else seems to teach and you don't know why the problem is not the verse the problem is me. The problem is you. It's our understanding. Uh, we, we don't have perfect understanding. We need to keep digging and keep looking and, and keep trying to find uh, the right answers in God's word. And I thought, boy, you know, if, if this doctrine of, uh, we call the doctrine of eternal security, if that's not correct, we really have to change the words to a lot of songs in our hymnals. Blessed assurance, sort of. Jesus is mine, I think. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Oh, please, please, I hope, I hope. I mean, how are we going to change all the words of these songs? The songs aren't important. The scripture is what's important. But the songs just reflect that and tell it. In, um, in this passage in Hebrews 10, it says, For by one offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. One offering. It's Christ's offering, and the offering actually happens to be Christ. That's the offering. One time it was given before God to solve all the problems for all the world, and it, the result is it's complete. It's perfected. It's complete in Christ for all time. It's for all time. It's those who are sanctified, those who are born again, those who believe in Christ, those who have him, who are followers of him, uh, it is done, it's complete, and it's until uh, we stand before Christ. <clears throat> All the value of the completed work of the cross is placed by God on the account of the sinner. Everything that Jesus did, all that wonderful gift that he's done is put on your account when you come to Christ. You can't do it. 
You can never do it. It's only Christ and him alone who's done that for you. Scripture consistently carries that same theme. Our salvation rests in God, and we are safe in God's love, safe in Jesus Christ and in his power. No one, not you, not even the devil, can sever that vital union when you are in Christ Jesus. It's his death and his resurrection that purchased us. It's his finished work on the cross, not our work. It's his finished work on the cross that saves us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the grace and for this power that you have to rescue us from sins, to change us by the power of the Spirit of God, to work in our lives and bring a transformation and change us, uh, even making us into the image of Christ. That's a daily, every moment of the day job that you work on in our hearts and lives. And we're just so grateful and thankful to you for your work, your gift, of eternal life. God, help us to, to settle the, the basic issues and to move forward with you and to live in victory in Christ. We want to honor you. We want to serve you. We want to bring glory to your name. Help us to do that. In Christ we pray.